Welcome to Inside Urgent Care, the podcast that shares stories from within, you guessed it, the side of healthcare we all know and love, urgent care. This is the space for you to hear inside perspectives and authentic conversations from those working in the space. Thank you for being here and let's get into it. Hello and welcome back to Inside Urgent Care, where we share inside stories and perspectives from those working in urgent care. I'm Samantha Wolf, Communications Director at the Urgent Care Association, and we're happy to have you back with us today. Today's episode is Emergency Perspectives, and we're joined by Dr. Matthew Delaney, who is a professor of emergency medicine at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and is also the host of the ERCast with Hippo Education. Welcome to the podcast, and thank you so much for being here, Matt. Yeah, it's a pleasure. No, it's, it's, it's a treat to get to talk to the urgent care world. Can you give us a little bit of your background and your relationship to urgent care? Yeah, I knew nothing about urgent care. I'd never seen an urgent care on the inside until 10 years ago. I am EM trained. My father is a family medicine doctor. So growing up, we just didn't go to the doctor. It's what's the expression, the cobbler's kids have holes in their shoes. So I really hadn't been inside a doctor's office. I'd never been inside an urgent care. And I was working in emergency medicine and I started getting into podcasting. And one of my first mentors said, Look, I don't know if you're ready to come on the show that was emergency medicine specific, but we're starting a new show that's focused mostly on the urgent care. Do you have any expertise in urgent care? Would you like to be on the show? And so I did what most people would do in the situation. I said, yeah, I know a lot about the urgent care. I'd love to be on the show. And so as soon as I got off the call with her, I called the urgent care associated with our university and said, can I pick up some shifts <laughs> and started picking up shifts and, and loved what I did. And so I did kind of bluff my way through the first year or two of working on urgent care wrap, which I think a lot of you may have heard. Um, but that that is what got me into urgent care was a white lie telling someone I could do a podcast about urgent cares and then realizing that it's different. It's not the same as emergency medicine. It's not just primary care. And luckily, you know, sometimes uh, fortune or the Lord smile on the foolish. And I, I got by that first couple of months not knowing anything about urgent care and really found that I loved working in the urgent care as part of my my practice in medicine. Well, thank you for being so candid with us. I don't know that anyone would know that. If you went back to early episodes, you might suspect that I don't really understand what an urgent care is. I talked about MRIs a lot, but no, I mean, I think just getting in the urgent care was incredibly educational, at least for me. Yeah. Yeah. So shifting gears a little bit, thank you for that background. What are some of the most common ER presentations that could actually go to an urgent care center? All right. So I have some thoughts here. But I want to get it out of the way, and I want to apologize for all of us in the emergency department. If we've ever given you attitude when you've tried to ship a patient from the UC to the ED, I am sorry for all of us. I think a lot of it is that if you've not worked in urgent care, you don't really understand a lot of things about it. I didn't realize urgent care is closed. I mean, I work in emergency medicine. We're always open. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that I got to get this person to you because we're closing was foreign. That being said, when I put my urgent care hat on, I think there are two big things that jump out that we see in the ED a lot. A lot of times these are send-ins, not necessarily from the urgent care, but maybe a primary care. You call and say, hey, can I come in for this? And they say, oh, you're too sick, probably too sick for urgent care, go to the ED. But the two things I see, the first is generally a patient with some kind of skin or soft tissue infection and the kind of question or the reason for the ED visit is, uh, do they need IV antibiotics? And, and I get it. We see tons of cellulitis. We know across the board that cellulitis has a 20% bounce back rate. And so often we'll see a patient that maybe we treated for an abscess. We sent them out of the urgent care. They show back up. It's, it's getting worse or it's not getting better. And so I can understand thinking we need IV antibiotics. But I think the thing to keep in mind and the thing I always remind myself is that a lot of the antibiotics that we commonly would reach for, for skin and soft tissue infections, have really good oral bioavailability. So things like doxycycline, levofloxacin, clindamycin, these are 90% bioavailable. So if we're looking at a case of cellulitis and the patient overall looks okay, rather than pulling the trigger and saying, I got to send you to the ED for IV antibiotics, I would challenge all of us to say, can we not look at using an oral agent that has good bioavailability because that saves the patient both the hassle expense of going to the emergency department, but also there are risks that we all know associated with IV antibiotic use. So that's that first category is if we're looking at cellulitis or an abscess, I pause and think, can I use oral antibiotics with high degrees of bioavailability? Mm -hmm. 
The second category, and this one is a little harder because I, I get it. All urgent cares are different. I've worked in an urgent care that did have rapid access to an MRI. I've worked in an urgent care that really didn't have labs. But if you're in an urgent care that has the ability to do an EKG, a chest x or your troponin, I, I, I would strongly encourage all of us, if you have those things, to really get comfortable with chest pain presentations and really get comfortable with using something like the heart score. And basically, a lot of these patients we know are low risk in terms of, is this chest pain coming from an underlying acute coronary syndrome? But they're not no risk. So I would challenge all of us on the UC side of things, if we have those resources, try to risk stratify these patients in the urgent care, rather than just empirically. And a lot of times this happens, I feel like at the front desk, oh, chest pain, go to the emergency department. But if we've got the resources in our urgent care, a lot of those patients can safely be risk stratified at the bedside within two hours in the urgent care, which I know it's a long stay, but it, when you're talking about saving a patient from going to the emergency department, mm -hmm. I would say that those are the ones we could pick off and say, this is something we can do well in the urgent care if we have the resources. Yeah. And I think that helps us tell our story to our stakeholders, to patients, to legislators so much better too, because that's our main elevator pitch, right? We help take volume out of the emergency room so they can focus on true emergencies. Yeah, and a lot of it is, it, I agree, it's to the stakeholders, it's to the public, but even just within the house of medicine, I think there's this sense that urgent care medicine is kind of junior varsity medicine, and we know mm -hmm. that's not true. Mm -hmm. So I think we should be, and a lot of us are good about this, up on the literature, and we should be really practicing at the top of our license, given the resources that we have. I get it, though. I know it's tempting to just hit that release valve and say go to the ED, but I think we do better, our patients do better, our reputation as a profession is better if we can try to own more things in the urgent care, if we do it safely. Right, right, exactly. What would you say is the strangest or maybe the most interesting emergency department presentation that you think could have gone to urgent care? Yeah, I'm going to mess this up. So if you're a physicist, I apologize. I was a resident in emergency medicine and I was working with my attending and two guys, a two-pack, two guys came in together and checked in and they said that they were there for bleeding gums hair loss, easy bruising, fatigue. And somewhere along the line, I'm talking to these guys and one's old, one's young. They don't seem like a natural pair to be hanging out. They mentioned they thought they had radiation sickness, hmm. which is an odd thing to see in the middle of the afternoon. I was working in Portland, Maine. Just, that didn't quite make sense. And I said, tell me about that. And the old guy says, you're going to think we're nuts. I was tracking with him. And he says, we have created cold fusion. I said, excuse me. He's like, yeah, no, but it's hard to believe. But I was nominated for the Nobel Prize. I'm a physicist and we have this basement lab and we've created cold fusion, which would solve the energy crisis. But the problem is we couldn't contain it well and we have radiation poisoning. And I said, oh my gosh. Okay. So I go get my attending and he comes in the room and he talks to him for a while and he comes out and he picks up the phone and he calls the local FBI. And says, you know, I got these guys, they've created cold fusion. And the FBI had actually investigated these guys. And this guy had, in fact, been nominated for a Nobel Prize. Didn't win, but was nominated for a Nobel Prize in physics. But my attending says, but I know they're lying. And I said, well, how do you know that? He goes, well, you know, when you create fission, so a nuclear reaction, you create radiation. So if they get radiation sickness, they've done a nuclear reaction with fission, mm -hmm. which they're not claiming. But fusion creates helium, which wouldn't give you radiation sickness. So they're a bunch of charlatans and they can go. And so he just discharges them. And it turns out that these guys were not crazy, but certainly a bit of scam artists. And they've been going up and down the East Coast trying to get diagnosed with radiation sickness in a way to kind of validate their research. And so it was, at first, one of the weirdest things I've ever seen in my entire life. But when you look at it, they didn't need a lot of resources. They just needed some clinician who understood the difference between fusion and fission. And that, that one sticks yeah. with me. I would love to have that come into the urgent care. And honestly, those guys are probably still out there trying to get this diagnosis of radiation toxicity. Wow. That is incredible. That that would feel like a fever dream. It did. Yeah. <laughs> he still has not won the Nobel Prize as far as I can tell, but you know, hope springs eternal. So why is it important for patients to go to the right setting for their presentation, as we're talking about, you can go to urgent care or the ED. Why is that important? I mean, we all know this, and I think everybody in the urgent care has a sense of how tough it is in emergency departments right now nationwide, no matter where you practice. I just left the ED. We have about 50 beds, and we had 150 boarded patients in our emergency department. So I think the more we can do to, to decompress the emergency department, the better. 
But on the patient side, I think Vegas odds are you will get seen more quickly if you go to an urgent care. I know sometimes the wait is long, but I'm telling you, I would bet sight unseen that the wait to urgent care is less than most emergency departments. And then past that, you know, you also are leaving the emergency department for the true emergencies. And patients don't always know. You know, chest pain could be an aortic dissection, could be indigestion. I don't fault folks for coming to urgent care with something that could be a true emergency, but it is crucial. And we're seeing increased morbidity and mortality in emergency departments due to crowding. So I think if we can leave the emergency departments for the times we in the urgent care need them, then when we have a sick patient, we can call 911 get them over there rather than being told we're on a version, you know, call the next hospital down the road. And on the patient side of things, and this isn't 100%, but generally it's actually much more affordable to get seen in the urgent care. I, I think that there's a lot more price transparency. I mean, some people list the prices. This is what this costs here. And for patients, and it's easy to forget, especially if you have commercial insurance, you kind of hit your copay and then it doesn't really add up that much. But for a lot of folks, especially people who are self-insured, somebody who owns a small business, an ED visit could be financially ruinous. You know, they go in for an ankle sprain, come out to $8,000 bill, just the way that billing happens in the ED. So I think patients get seen quicker. We can preserve the ED. And I think that from a cost saving standpoint, man, I'm going to choose urgent care over ED any day that I can. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Me, me too. In my personal life. Absolutely. Always. What are some things you think can be done to help continue to divert non-emergencies from the ED? It's tough. I, I, I would love to say that we should educate the public. And you guys are doing that. I know that a lot of us are trying to get the word out about this is what the urgent care is really for. This is what the ED is really for. But I worry that that may be, uh, I worry we may be hitting the limits of what we can do from an education standpoint. And I think about it this way, the emergency department where I work is one of the top three sickest hospitals in the country based on acuity and emission rates. And we still send about seven out of 10 patients home from the ED. So seven of the 10 people mm -hmm. that come in, they didn't come for the wrong reasons, but they weren't sick enough to be admitted. And, and so even they don't know. I think it's very hard to self-triage and self-diagnose. I'm a doctor. I had perforated appendicitis. I had no idea. Totally whiffed. Had no clue that's what was going on. And so, you know, I, I want the public to seek help when they think they need to see a clinician. Mm -hmm. I think we should keep educating them about, hey, you know, lacerations, sprains, strains. That's great. Go to the urgent care. You know, URIs, go to the urgent care. But the problem is, you know, a patient wakes up with a stuffy nose and a cough, they may have had a family member die of pneumonia. They may think they have something life-threatening. So I, I, I'm all for the education efforts. Mm -hmm. I spend a lot of my time doing this, but I do think to just, it's hard to just blame the public. And I think as we try to say, hey, public, let's let's be better about where we go for our care, kind of like we talked about with earlier with the oral antibiotics and the chest pain, I think we need to take ownership of doing the best we can. And my sense is that most of us are doing this, but really working hard to say, I'm going to try to keep this patient here. I know this laceration is a little bigger than I normally would fix. I'm going to put the time in here to not have to send this to the ED. And, and just to be clear, urgent cares are not the reason emergency departments are falling apart or overrun. But I do think we can do on every shift, really challenge ourselves. Next time you want to send somebody to the ED, try to talk yourself out of it. Try to try to argue from the other side and really save it for the times when I just can't help this patient the way I think they need to be helped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I certainly, it is difficult because when you know what the issue is, it's one thing. And that's what we're going to be working more to do on a patient facing campaign down the road. But you don't want to take chances either with your health. So there certainly is no blame on that front. And I completely agree that whatever we can do in a, in a UC should be done so they don't have to go to an, or an emergency department. And then if something similar happens down the road, they don't think that they need to go to the emergency department because it was able to be handled in an urgent care center. Yeah, yeah I mean, patients are going to show up for reasons that you and I know aren't a reason to seek medical care. But I always remind myself that this patient almost certainly didn't wake up today to ruin my day. Although sometimes it feels like they may have woken up to ruin my day. There are those patients out there. But if you really can take the time, even five seconds, to get to the, why did you come here today? Most sure. patients are worried, right? And so I think it's, you know, if they show up at the urgent care, they should have gone to ED or vice versa. They're probably well-intentioned. They're totally wrong often. 
but again, they were worried. They thought something was wrong. Uh, so, so again, it's hard to it's hard to educate the patients without blaming them. But I think it's a, it's a tough issue. And really, I can own what I do, which is I decide when I want to send somebody to the ED. I think I can be a little bit better about that. Right. So as far as urgent care as a career choice, why do you think oftentimes urgent care is an attractive career choice for emergency clinicians? It's interesting because when I started emergency medicine, it was kind of you went to the urgent care at the end of your career and you're kind of burned out in the ED and I'm going to go to the urgent care because the sense was that it would be easier. I'll tell you, that's not always the case. I've had some rough urgent care shifts and some cake ED shifts, but you know, I think about my experience in urgent care, it's, I get a lot of variety that I don't necessarily see in the emergency department. It's, it's kind of that beautiful overlap of emergency medicine and primary care, kind of urgent, if not emergent care. And I, I knew some about that, but just to, to really kind of understand the full scope of, you know, something as simple as an asthma exacerbation, you know, sometimes it's milder in the urgent care. I, I'm not, was not as good at that type of presentation. I'm good when you're really sick with asthma. So I think it does challenge us to really use kind of the whole breadth of our license. Uh, the flexibility is nice. I mean, there are few, much, many, many fewer overnight shifts. There are fewer holiday shifts. I know that they're still out there, but it, the, the grind, the, the timing of ED shifts, I think urgent cares do give you some flexibility. Practice location, you know, there are tons of urgent cares. It's easy to, to, to get shifts you know, different, different locations, different patient populations. And then the last thing that I've noticed more and more is we get to do stuff in the urgent care that's actually stuff we would never do in the emergency department, things like workman's comp. Now, you might not want to do that, and I would say don't work in an urgent care where that's a big part of your practice, but some of that stuff I find to be very rewarding. Some urgent cares have a, a lot of wound care patients. That can be really cool and can be really satisfying. And so I, I think it's just using your skills from the ED in an environment where the patients are a little different and the resources are, are, and the resources are a little different. I think, you know, I would argue that everybody that works in an emergency department should work at least a handful of shifts in urgent care. If for mm -hmm. no other reason than to understand the challenges of the urgent care and some people won't like it, but a lot of people, it's a nice shift of gears that I think is something that people should try before they're burned out and just need something different than the emergency department. And I would think that it helps them understand if they need just from that relational standpoint between, you know, urgent care centers sending people to the emergency department, just to have a good relationship with the centers in your community, I think would be super helpful. Oh, it's great. It's so much easier now when I pick up the phone and the urgent care is calling and I know it's Andy and I have that relationship and we can have a conversation as opposed to like, oh, great, it's the urgent care calling again. And and the reverse, when I call from the urgent care, it's awesome to have a relationship. So yeah, if you don't want to work in urgent care, at least get to know the people in your urgent care that's sending you patients. Mm -hmm. It makes it better for everybody. Absolutely. All right. So what are some current visits or trends that maybe you're currently seeing out there? Two things we're seeing a ton of, and the literature is capturing this, but it's still kind of staggering. The first is, I would call it cannabis misadventures. And so, you know, I don't know the numbers exactly. A quarter of states have recreational cannabis, but then almost every state has some form of legal cannabis. There's the Delta 8s, Delta 9s, THCAs, there are all these cannabinoids, these novel cannabinoids mm -hmm. that now are legal in most states. And what we're seeing a ton in Alabama, because we do not have legal cannabis, but we have dispensaries everywhere selling this legal weed. And I think the public is totally misinformed. I think they think it's not like weed. It's almost in some cases, it is exactly the same as cannabis when you ignite it. And then so this underappreciation of what this stuff can do. And then People are just taking crazy doses of things. We're seeing tons of trouble. And the literature is shouting this. These edibles that folks are taking, people think, oh, it's a candy. What is it, 50 milligrams? Sure, I'll pop it. This will be fine. It's not really weed. Well, it will really make you very high. And so we're trying to do a lot of education about if you're a, a, an adult with the capacity to make decisions and you can legally get an intoxicating substance, we want you to be safe. We're in the world of harm reduction. That, But don't think, and a lot of times it's like, a nice, someone's nice uncle who's like, I've never tried weed before and I got these gummies. They have no idea the dosing. So the dosing should be five milligrams. Yeah. Five milligrams. If you really want to get real wild, go to 10. But please, please, just because something's legal, 
don't just eat the whole bag full. And I think the education piece on our side, I always tell patients, and I've got a little printout, look, this is what this is. This is the dosing, but we're seeing a ton of that. If I guess if you've never been high, these people are very concerned and they just can't understand. It. And it's like, well, you did, you took the drug and it did what it said it was going to do. <laughs> so we're seeing tons of cannabis misadventures, mostly around edibles. Cause again, you take that edible, well, you bought that whole dose. It's not like taking a puff of something. You're going to ride that horse for a couple of hours. The, the other thing that we're seeing a lot of, and it's not funny that like cannabis can be funny, but it's spinal epidural abscesses. And this is largely due to the IV drug epidemic that we're all dealing with. But I mean, I remember 10 years ago, you rarely saw these spinal infections in young patients. I would say now, if you see a patient in the urgent care that has back pain, we have got to stop and at least think, could this be spinal epidural abscess? Now, it doesn't mean they all need to get sent to the ED for an MRI. They don't all need testing, but I would say, given the incidents of epidural abscesses that we're seeing, and also the incidents of the, the cases that we're missing. Um, this is very, very heavily litigated. So anytime I see a back pain in the urgent care, I ask any history of surgery to your spine, any history of IV drug abuse, and then I ask kind of infectious symptoms. And then I specifically will chart, I think they're low risk in terms of having a spinal epidural abscess. That seems crazy because sometimes it's like, oh, I picked up a box and I hurt my back. The last epidural abscess I had, that was their story. They were moving tiles and they picked up a box. And so this is out there. It is what used to be a needle in a haystack, and now it feels like a stack of needles. So we don't need to go crazy, but I think that cognitive pause to think, could this be a spinal epidural abscess, I think will help us catch cases. And then in the ones that are hard to catch, the atypical presentations, that's a level of medical legal protection I think all of us would like. So just have a, a dot phrase or a free text. Hey, I thought about epidural abscess. I think it's unlikely. I think we'll do better by our patients than protect ourselves too. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's that's so interesting that those cases seem to be spiking where they were not the norm before. Yeah, it's a bad problem. And, and, and you know, this is another conversation for another day. The workup of these patients is very complicated. So again, if you get a patient that's got back pain, had used IV drugs, had a low-grade fever, send that patient to the ED. I will not fuss at you. And if somebody fusses you, I'll yell at them because th these are complex patients. They have horrible outcomes if missed. They have bad outcomes if treated. But yeah, if you're thinking epidural abscess, number one, always think about it. But if you're worried at all, send them to a higher level of care. Do not feel bad about that. Mm -hmm. And when you were speaking about your cannabis misadventure stories, that is something that I never thought about because I'm not in that world and interacting with patients day to day. But the education for cannabis just really isn't out there, right? So you're the front line of that education a lot of the times when it goes bad. Yeah, and it's, you know, very few people die from cannabis, but you sure. can get in a lot of trouble and you can just ruin your night. And you're right. Even if you go to these stores or go online, it's hard to get good guidance. But just know there is a dose. Look it up and that this is not fake weed. This stuff will, will get you as high as the kind of quote, real weed. Right. Right. Well, I think that kind of brings us to the end here. Um, before we go, though, we do wrap up each episode with a little story from our guests, um, maybe a sneak peek behind the scenes into urgent care. But I mean, your cold fusion story was kind of spot on with that one. But do you have happen to have any other stories to share with us before we head on out? Yeah, you know, one of the things that always stresses me out the most, it, it's not sick patients, it's not diagnostic uncertainty, it's learning a new system, whether that's the electronic health record, whether that's where do I park. And one of my old mentors told me, you can't look like you know what you're doing unless you know where to pee and poop. So where is the bathroom that I'm supposed to use is always one of the first things I want to figure out when I work in a new setting. And I was working in an urgent care and it was my first shift. And the staff bathroom just wasn't going to be a place I was going to use. It was too public and didn't look that clean. But there was a patient bathroom kind of in the corner. And so I went there and it's using the restroom. And uh, it had these new locks on the door that they called suicide locks. And basically, it's you can lock it, but if someone wants to get in, they jiggle it enough and it'll open. Mm -hmm. And I go in there and I'm using the restroom and I hear it jiggle. I said, somebody's in here. I hear it jiggle. Somebody's in there. And the door flies open and my next patient is standing there just looking at me. And I said, hey, hey, it's it's okay. Can you please shut the door? And uh, not only did she not shut the door, she turned and walked away. And then when I looked past where she was standing, I was staring at the nurse's station and they're all looking at me sitting on the toilet. Oh, and no. so then I had to uh, kind of bend over at the waist, 
uh, kind of shuffle over to the door, shut the door. But then I had to come out and talk to the nurses and see that patient. And so I, I just, you know, again, it's very important that we know what we're doing. That's a huge part of medicine, but also having the confidence. And I, I'll tell you, I did not, I may have had the competence that day, but the confidence is gone after everyone in the urgent care saw me trying to use the restroom. That is totally understandable. And yeah, something that you might not think about in your, in a new setting, but definitely want to have your bearings to feel that uh, confidence. I totally thought that was an analogy initially when he said, oh, you got to figure out where you need to go to the bathroom. I thought that was going to be an analogy for something. Oh, no. You literally, literally <laughs> need to, you really need to know where to use the restroom. Yeah. I yeah, mean, that's a, that's absolutely. a huge, that, there's a huge fight in our health system because there's one restroom that nobody wants to tell other people about. I know where it is. I'm not telling. So yeah, that's a big <laughs> part of working successfully. Where to use the restroom. That's great. Thank you. All right. Well, do you have anything else for us today? No, thank you all for what you do. You guys are making a huge difference on the UC side of things. We appreciate it in the ED. Take no feedback or noise off us if we're rude to you on the phone. Let me know. I'll start yelling at folks. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for being here and sharing all of your experience and expertise. And listeners, thank you for listening in. Talk soon. Bye.